Story seven of the House with the Mezzanine and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story seven My Life The Story of a Provincial Part seventeen and eighteen. Part seventeen. On Sunday afternoon my sister came to see me and had tea with me. I read a great deal now, she said, showing me the books she had got out of the town library on her way. Thanks to your wife and Vladimir, they awakened my self-consciousness. They saved me and have made me feel that I am a human being. I used not to sleep at night for worrying. What a lot of sugar has been wasted during the week. The cucumbers must not be over-salted. I don't sleep now, but I have quite different thoughts. I am tormented with the thought that half my life has passed so foolishly and half-heartedly. I despise my old life, I am ashamed of it, and I regard my father now as an enemy. Oh, how grateful I am to your wife! And Vladimir! He is such a wonderful man! They opened my eyes! It is not good that you can't sleep, I said. You think I am ill? Not a bit! Vladimir sounded me and says I am perfectly healthy, but health is not the point. That doesn't matter so much. Tell me, am I right? She needed moral support, that was obvious. Masha had gone, Dr. Blagovo was in Petersburg, and there was no one except myself in the town who could tell her that she was right. She fixed her eyes on me, trying to read my inmost thoughts, and if I were sad in her presence she always took it upon herself and was depressed. I had to be continually on my guard, and when she asked me if she was right, I hastened to assure her that she was right, and that I had profound respect for her. "'You know, they have given me a part at the Azequins,' she went on. "'I wanted to act. I want to live. I want to drink deep of life. I have no talent whatever, and my part is only ten lines, but it is immeasurably finer and nobler than pouring out tea five times a day and watching to see that the cook does not eat the sugar left over. And most of all, I want to let father see that I, too, can protest. After tea she lay down on my bed and stayed there for some time, with her eyes closed and her face very pale. Just weakness, she said, as she got up. Vladimir said all town girls and women are anemic from lack of work. What a clever man Vladimir is! He is right, wonderfully right. We do need work. Two days later she came to rehearsal at the Azequins with her part in her hand. She was in black, with a garnet necklace and a brooch that looked at a distance like a pasty, and she had enormous earrings in each of which sparkled a diamond. I felt uneasy when I saw her. I was shocked by her lack of taste. The others noticed, too, that she was unsuitably dressed, and that her earrings and diamonds were out of place. I saw their smiles, and heard someone say jokingly, Cleopatra of Egypt. She was trying to be fashionable and easy and assured, and she seemed affected and odd. She lost her simplicity and her charm. I just told father that I was going to a rehearsal, she began, coming up to me, and he shouted that he would take his blessing from me, and he nearly struck me. Fancy, she added, glancing at her part, I don't know my part. I'm sure to make a mistake. Well, the die is cast, she said excitedly, the die is cast. She felt that all people were looking at her, and were all amazed at the important step she had taken, and that they were all expecting something remarkable from her, and it was impossible to convince her that nobody took any notice of such small, uninteresting persons as she and I. She had nothing to do until the third act, and her part, a guest, a country gossip, consisted only in standing by the door, as if she were overhearing something, and then speaking a short monologue. For at least an hour and a half before her cue, while the others were walking, reading, having tea, quarrelling, she never left me and kept on mumbling her part and dropping her written copy, imagining that everybody was looking at her and waiting for her to come on, 
and she patted her hair with a trembling hand and said, "'I'm sure to make a mistake. You don't know how awful I feel. I am as terrified as if I were going to the scaffold.' At last her cue came. "'Cleopatra Alexeyevna, your cue,' said the manager. She walked on to the middle of the stage with an expression of terror on her face. She looked ugly and stiff, and for half a minute was speechless, perfectly motionless, except for her large earrings, which wobbled on either side of her face. "'You can read your part the first time,' said someone. I could see that she was trembling, so that she could neither speak nor open her part, and that she had entirely forgotten the words, and I had just made up my mind to go up and say something to her, when she suddenly dropped down on her knees in the middle of the stage and sobbed loudly. There was a general stir and uproar, and I stood quite still by the wings, shocked by what had happened, not understanding at all not knowing what to do. I saw them lift her up and lead her away. I saw Anwita Blagovo come up to me. I had not seen her in the hall before, and she seemed to have sprung up from the floor. She was wearing a hat and veil, and as usual looked as if she had only dropped in for a minute. I told her not to try to act, she said angrily, biting out each word with her cheeks blushing. It is folly. You ought to have stopped her. Mrs. Azequin came up in a short jacket with short sleeves. She had tobacco ash on her thin, flat bosom. "'My dear, it is too awful,' she said, wringing her hands, and as usual staring into my face. "'It is too awful. Your sister is in a condition. She is going to have a baby. You must take her away at once.' In her agitation she breathed heavily, and behind her stood her three daughters, all thin and flat-chested like herself, and all huddled together in their dismay. They were frightened, overwhelmed, just as if a convict had been caught in the house. What a shame! How awful! And this was the family that had been fighting the prejudices and superstitions of mankind all their lives. Evidently they thought that all the prejudices and superstitions of mankind were to be found in burning three candles and in the number thirteen, or the unlucky day, Monday. I must request, request, Mrs. Azequin kept on saying, compressing her lips and accentuating the quest, I must request you to take her away. End of Part 17 Part 18. A little later my sister and I were walking along the street. I covered her with the skirt of my overcoat. We hurried along through by-streets, and where there were no lamps, avoiding the passers-by, and it was like a flight. She did not weep any more, but stared at me with dry eyes. It was about twenty minutes' drive to Mikokov, whither I was taking her, and in that short time we went over the whole of our lives, and talked over everything, and considered the position, and pondered. We decided that we could not stay in the town, and that, when I could get some money, we would go to some other place. In some of the houses the people were asleep already, and in others they were playing cards. We hated those houses, were afraid of them, and we talked of the fanaticism, callousness, and nullity of these respectable families, these lovers of dramatic art whom we had frightened so much, and I wondered how those stupid, cruel, slothful, dishonest people were better than the drunken, superstitious peasants of Kurilovka or how they were better than animals, which also lose their heads when some accident breaks the monotony of their lives, which are limited by their instincts. What would happen to my sister if she stayed at home? What moral torture would she have to undergo, talking to my father and meeting acquaintances every day? I imagined it all, and there came into my memory people I had known who had been gradually dropped by their friends and relations, and I remember the tortured dogs which had gone mad, and sparrows plucked alive and thrown into the water, 
and a whole long series of dull, protracted sufferings which I had seen going on in the town since my childhood, and I could not conceive what the sixty thousand inhabitants lived for, why they read the Bible, why they prayed, why they skimmed books and magazines. What good was all that had been written and said if they were in the same spiritual darkness and had the same hatred of freedom as if they were living hundreds and hundreds of years ago? The builder spends his time putting up houses all over the town, and yet would go down to his grave saying, Gallery for gallery, and the sixty thousand inhabitants had read and heard of truth and mercy and freedom for generations, but to the bitter end they would go on lying from morning to night, tormenting one another, fearing and hating freedom as a deadly enemy. And so my fate is decided, said my sister when we reached home. After what has happened I can never go there again. My God, how good it is! I feel at peace. She lay down at once. Tears shone on her eyelashes, but her expression was happy. She slept soundly and softly, and it was clear that her heart was easy and that she was at rest. For a long, long time she had not slept so well. So we began to live together. She was always singing and said she felt very well and I took back the books we had borrowed from the library unread, because she gave up reading. She only wanted to dream and to talk of the future. She would hum as she mended my clothes, or helped Karpovna with the cooking, or talk of her Vladimir, of his mind and his goodness, and his fine manners and his extraordinary learning. And I agreed with her, though I no longer liked the doctor. She wanted to work, to be independent, and to live by herself. She said she would become a school-teacher or a nurse as soon as her health allowed, and she would scrub the floors and do her own washing. She loved her unborn baby passionately, and she knew already the color of his eyes and the shape of his hands and how he laughed. She liked to talk of his upbringing, and since the best man on earth was Vladimir, all her ideas were reduced to making the boy as charming as his father. There was no end to her chatter, and everything she talked about filled her with a lively joy. Sometimes I too rejoiced, though I knew not why. She must have infected me with her dreaminess, for I too read nothing and just dreamed. In the evenings, in spite of being tired, I used to pace up and down the room with my hands in my pockets talking about Masha. When do you think she will return? I used to ask my sister. I think she'll be back at Christmas, not later. What is she doing there? If she doesn't write to you, it means she must be coming soon. True, I would agree, though I knew very well that there was nothing to make Masha return to our town. I missed her very much, but I could not help deceiving myself and wanted others to deceive me. My sister was longing for her doctor, I for Masha, and we both laughed and talked and never saw that we were keeping Karpovna from sleeping. She would lie on the stove and murmur, The samovar tinkled this morning, tinkled! That bodes nobody any good, my merry friends. Nobody came to the house except the postman, who brought my sister letters from the doctor, and Prokofi, who used to come in sometimes in the evening and glance secretly at my sister, and then go into the kitchen and say, Every class has its ways, and if you're too proud to understand that, the worse for you in this veil of tears. He loved the expression, veil of tears, and about Christmas time, when I was going through the market, he called me into his shop, and without giving me his hand, declared that he had some important business to discuss. He was red in the face with the frost and with vodka. Near him, by the counter, stood Nikolka, of the murderous face, holding a bloody knife in his hand. "'I want to be blunt with you,' began Prokofi. This business must not happen, because, as you know, people will neither forgive you nor us for such a veil of tears. Mother, of course, is too dutiful to say anything unpleasant to you herself, and tell you that your sister must go somewhere else because of her condition. 
but I don't want it either, because I do not approve of her behavior. I understood and left the shop. That very day my sister and I went to Radish's. We had no money for a cab, so we went on foot. I carried a bundle with all our belongings on my back. My sister had nothing in her hands, and she was breathless, and kept coughing and asking if we would soon be there. End of Part 18